it's probably time and to get started. Um, first of all, housekeeping. This session is being recorded so that we can indeed pop it up on YouTube so that people who aren't able to make it in person, wow, uh, someone's here in the, from the US. It's quite early in the morning for them. So for the people who weren't brave enough to stay up till 1am, we are recording this session so that you'll be able to watch it later. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on, or well, I am on the um, lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and thank them for their care of their land. Uh, and for us to be able to be doing this today, I recognise that we are on many traditional lands and that here in Australia, sovereignty has never been ceded. So over the past two days plus, a keynote last week, we've been doing a lot of talking about in assessment for inclusion. And we're here now um, for the final event of this open event of the symposium uh, to think about the big ideas in assessment for inclusion. Uh, and we have a wonderful panel of people who represent, I think, quite diverse perspectives uh, to help us model through some of the questions we've had over the past couple of days. Um, and we note Amina um, yesterday pointed out that it's frequently there are a lot of keynotes and seminars, but not many chances to participate in the conversation. And um, as Jan MacArthur noted last week, you know, we are in this little rock pool together and it is a bit of an ongoing process. Uh, so I would invite you all, and this is a panel, to ask your questions using the Q&A function um, as we get started and as we continue through to this afternoon's session. So I'd like to now introduce the panel. We have Professor Sarah O'Shea, Director, National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education here in Australia. We've got Dr. Jessamy Gleeson, who's a Senior Lecturer and an Associate Director Teaching and Learning at Deakins Naikiri Institute, which is our... Um, Oh, I'll let Jess, in. and I'll let all the panelists introduce themselves more when they come to talk. We've also got Dr. Ben Whitburn, Senior Lecturer of Inclusive Education and Director of the Masters of Specialist Inclusive Education, also from Deakin. And we've got Professor Phil Dawson, who is Associate Director of the Centre for Research and Assessment and Digital Learning, Cradle at Deakin University. Um, but before we get the four panelists to say a little bit about their takeaways about big ideas for assessment for inclusion. I'd also like to invite David Bow, Director of Cradle, to say a few words before we get started. Oh, thanks very much, Joe. Um, well, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Cradle, and I'd like to welcome the panellists and, and everyone who's joining in. Um, each year at a, roughly this time, we have an international symposium or something very similar. And that takes the form normally of inviting people from all over the place, all over Australia, and indeed all over the world, to come together to look at some, what you might call hot topic that relates to assessment or digital learning. And we've been doing this for a number of years. We get a group of people together. They do a whole lot of preparation before they come. We have a lot of interaction together. Um, and that results in typically a book or some other kind of series of publications that take that idea and, and really move it forward. And this year, the topic we've been uh, addressing has been assessment for inclusion. So for the last few days, as Joe was uh, mentioning, we've been having these discussions, we've been having some keynotes, all in the remote uh, mode, um, as we are only too familiar with at the moment, and organising discussions having read papers in advance and talking about them and looking at what are the things on the agenda of assessment for inclusion. And as part of these events each year, we have a open public session so that in terms of uh, people that weren't a part of that group really doing the intensive discussion, we let the doors open and enable anyone who wishes to, to have a glimpse at some of the discussion, some of the issues, some of the things which are uh, exercising our attention on that particular topic. So that's what we've got today. And I'd like to uh, 
Thank you for being here and hand back to Joe and the panel. Thank you. Um, and one thing I was remiss in doing was introducing myself and Rola, the other two people you might see on the screen. Um, so my name's Joanna Tai. I'm Senior Research Fellow at Cradle and one of the co-chairs of the symposium this year. And uh, Associate Professor Rola Jawi is the other co-chair. And we will be managing the Q&A. So please throw all the curly questions and we will sort through them. Um, so I'd like to start off by inviting Sarah O'Shea to start off the panel discussion. Oh, thank you, Joe, um, and thank you, everyone at Cradle, for inviting me to participate in this two days. It's been really interesting. And just before I begin, I'd too like to acknowledge the lands that I'm currently sitting on, which is the Wajak Noongar lands, and pay my respects to elders, past, present, and future. So, um, each of the panelists was asked to sort of talk about some of the big ideas or the key themes that they. Um, drew away from the last two days. And it was difficult for me because I was saying earlier that um, I found that this has been a really interesting uh, session, this whole symposium, because I feel that we're a group that have come together uh, and have similar uh, passions about equity and inclusion and uh, uh, social justice, but come at it with very different lenses. And so I've actually learned a lot about um, uh, different fields that I wouldn't necessarily know. But without further ado, I'm going to go on and talk about three. I'm doing it in threes. So sort of the three top themes, if you like, or top ideas that I drew away. So for me, probably one of the main themes was related to our use of language. So um, it came up repeatedly in the sessions that I attended. So we talked about inclusive assessment uh, and assessment for inclusion and what, what that language actually meant to each of us sort of differed. So for example, for some of the people who were attending, it was around um, accommodations being made to assessment, um, particularly for students with disability. And that brought up a really interesting uh, concept that while accommodations might seem to be doing good and be benefiting students, it actually serves to place students with disability in a deficit positioning as needing help um, or assistance. And that was made very clearly, I think, by Yuso uh, in his paper, where you know, he talks about how students with disabilities are a problem and need things done to them to facilitate access to higher ed. However, uh, Yuso, I'm, I'm drawing on you, Yuso, I know you're out there. Um, he, he suggested that we need to look at the entire system as being designed within a normative or ableist uh, framing and uh, did rejoice over Twitter, I saw yesterday evening, that we adopted that as a framing. Um, so if we consider assessment from that perspective, it actually gets us to question the very foundations of what assessments are needed for what they are assessing and who has the right to assess and who is being assessed. So I thought they were really interesting, uh, a really interesting start to unpacking the whole notion of assessment. Then the next big sort of idea that popped out for me was around um, application. So I think we were, there was a general consens consensus in the sessions I attended that uh, assessment as it stands is problematic. And there are issues around inclusivity. But then the question arose, well, how do we rethink assessment? Do we jettison it all together or do we reconsider what is being measured? Do we need to make assessments about the journey or rather than the destination? So again, I'm posing all the questions because I'm the first one on the panel, so I'm able to do that. Hopefully my colleagues will be answering some of these questions. So for me, really the, the big ideas for me were really around questioning things rather than coming up with solutions. And then I suppose the final one is thinking more deeply about what we want to achieve through assessment. So Penny Jane Burke um, in our session on Monday um, talked and uh, written about, and we talked about how uh, when students are asked to undertake assessments, they're actually being inducted into particular forms of speaking and writing that are constructed by discipline norms. Uh, and, and then we need to think about, well, who has the right to know 
how knowledge is constructed and who is the knowledge producer. So really drawing, thinking very deeply about knowledge and knowledge construction. Um, and Neera Jain, another uh, speaker from my session, introduced me to the concept of CRIP theory, which I'd never heard of. Thank you, Neera. Um, and talks about challenging us to adopt the vantage point of the atypical uh, when we are thinking and designing assessments. Um, and that then in turn uh, it forces us to question the notion of failure or how people with, um, with people who fail are, are considered. So I, as you can see, I, I've had a very rich understanding. And I think from my perspective, um, in that I come at this at, at an equity lens, I think that these conversations are very much needed because, um, you know, as Andrew Harvey reminded us all this morning in our, our, our get together, 47% of our students fall into a equity group or multiple equity groups. So we actually need to design with that, we're almost at the majority now of students being from um, equity categories or um, impacted by multiple or cumulative disadvantage. So the time is ripe to really question uh, how we are designing assessments and why are we designing them in that way. So I'll, I'll stop there and, um, and look forward to more. Thanks, Sarah. Um, next, we'll hear from Ben Whitpen. Ben. Hi, uh, and thanks everyone. And, uh, before we get going, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm also coming uh, from the Laundry lens uh, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also um, to thank the Cradle crew for inviting me to be part of uh, this symposium and also this panel, and also to my panel, uh, fellow panellists. Um, I must say, I feel in some ways that um, Sarah may have stolen uh, bits of my thunder. Uh, but I, let's hope I can um, expand on, on some points that um, uh, occur to me in particular. Now, one of the um, uh, big questions in inclusion for assessment or in assessment in, for inclusion that I think comes up time and time again and did so through uh, this symposium and does elsewhere is that, um, you know, at the same time uh, making adjustments uh, is questioned as being potentially redundant <clears throat> to the project of inclusive education in higher ed. Um, uh, a, a point of contention or a point that has been made um, quite emphatically throughout is that um, philosophy or theory is not an option. Uh, Jan made this point uh, on Thursday and, and it comes up time and time again. And um, I guess I want to expand on those notions in terms of thinking that um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking here about using theory both in conceptualising uh, how we think about uh, knowing difference and, and I guess understanding difference, uh, how we come at uh, understanding how students can express their understanding about difference, but also how we ourselves are uh, practising differently. and. Um, I guess to that end, um, one of the significant points that um, has also been made is that um, uh, while assessment, we often think of inclusive education largely being in relation to students from diversity groups or from uh, students in particular, uh, why don't we broaden that and consider that um, it's the inclusion of all of us that matters and therefore the assessment needs to be accessible and inclusive of both um, academics and students. Um, I think without doing that, we run the ongoing uh, risk of further conservatism in higher ed. Um, and and, and we, we need to make, um, I think, theory central in what we do both in um, assessing, but at the same time uh, to change the ways that uh, our students go out and apply theory in what they do uh, once they leave us. Um, to that end, uh, what did also come up quite clearly in the in the symposium in the last couple of days is that um, you know there are legal frameworks about inclusion, but there's no accountability. Um, and you know I, I think thereby assessment is a tool by which that we can um, you know move beyond the whole idea that uh, 
okay, we've got widened participation in higher ed, but how do we also push the inclusion agenda uh, towards uh, the other points of contention in universities, that is improving employability, and of course now job-ready graduates. Um, to that end, of course, um, assessment arbitrates what students uh, should know, and, and at the same time, though, what academics think they should know or are bound to um, ask them to think about in, in their professions. And, and I, I actually turn to um, uh, think and, and, and encourage my students to think also with um, some of the, book, of the work by uh, Roger Slee, who works, uh, and many would be familiar with Roger Slee in Inclusive Ed, uh, Policy and Practice. And he encourages, um, when we're thinking about using theory in particular, he says, you know, uh, there are three main questions that we should ask about what uh, a theory of inclusive ed uh, asks us to do. And I think we could expand this to, um, to assessment as well. Um, uh, included in what, excluded from what, and excluded by whom. And I personally uh, run a few units in inclusive ed in particular. Uh, encourage students to make uh, critical assessments of, of, of how theory helps them to engage different practices in order to um, push what they do towards uh, being more inclusive in, in once they go out and become teachers in schools. And I think, um, you know, we do get a lot of evaluations back from students that say, you know, what's this theory stuff? Um, but in many ways, um, Others come, a, come across at it uh, from, a, from quite a different perspective and say, well, I look forward to going to be able to apply some of these ideas about difference when I go into the classroom. And um, I think that's really important and something that is um, highly significant to what we do to, um, to uh, push this debate uh, forward. I'll pass that um, now on to, on to Phil. Thank you. Hey, thank, thanks so much, Ben. Um, I'm, I'm also coming in from Indigenous land. I'm coming in from the Wurundjeri land in inner southeast Melbourne and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now, I research assessment, feedback and cheating. That's where I live. And, and I want to start this by saying I might not actually be that radical. And, and I, I actually came away from... Um, the, the couple of days feeling like I'm actually not as radical as I might have thought I was because uh, I'm pretty happy to hold on to the idea that learning outcomes and assessment of learning and working within the framework that we inherit in Australia under legislation and whatever is, is okay. It's kind of what I have to do. Um, and I, I felt challenged by the days because it felt like um, you know, there are people who wanted to go further, who, who had things that might have even been incompatible with that sort of framework that we find ourselves within, uh, you know, to quote uh, Molly Dollinger from a group that I was in, to sort of burn it all to the ground even. Um, and I felt uh, challenged by these couple of days to be with such wonderful colleagues who were willing to really push things. So, yeah, as I said, I research cheating, feedback, assessment, um, with the cheating stuff, I kind of have come to this idea that maybe cheating and exclusion are the same sort of problem. And I'd love it if you'd go with me a little bit that um, they are threats to validity that matter for ethical reasons. Uh, so if we take uh, cheating, cheating's a threat to validity because it leads to assessors believing students can do something that they can't, but it's also a really complex ethical space with no easy answers. And inclusion feels like the same sort of problem. When we exclude, we pose these great threats to validity because exclusion in assessment, in addition to being the wrong thing to do, it also means assessors don't develop an accurate picture of what people are able to do if we take that traditional assessment view. So I, I and there's also all these intermingled stuff, you know, where we do things in the name of cheating, prevention, that have exclusionary effects. So that's sort of my in on all of this. I found it a fascinating few days. I found what Jan MacArthur had to say about compromise to be very interesting, uh, that we might not actually want to compromise all the time, that we might want to respect the integrity of the ideas and hold them in tension with each other sometimes. 
And I think in my work, I, I maybe I'm too keen to compromise sometimes. Maybe I want to stand firm on things. And I think to me, it feels like this is a space in which we do want to stand firm on inclusion. I found Penny Jane Burke's ideas around communities of praxis to be very powerful. And for me, it feels like the most likely way forward with this to get people together that do and, and think around all of this and to get us to work through the problems together. I'm partial to an argument that came through a bit during the symposium that inclusive assessment is good assessment. And to me, it has echoes of Marcia Devlin's work from about 10 years ago around teaching and learning for low SES students that, you know, you just do good, good teaching and learning practice for low SES students is good teaching and learning practice for everybody. Um, but there was also some great debate around who decides what's good. And Rosanna Burke's contribution that, you know, when she did something that was good, the students didn't necessarily see it as the preferable option. So we have to decide good for who, good, who, good in whose opinion. My final thing that I came away with was that inclusion is really, really, really hard. Um, we're not going to reach some sort of perfect utopia. For, for me, the hard part is that the things I can do as an individual are often influencing the micro factors, but a lot of this is determined by macro or systemic factors that I can't change, but that need to be changed, but I can't, I can't personally change them. But we can't let this lead to some sort of paralysis, uh, echoes of things like climate change, and I would hate for us to walk away from this deciding that we'll get to inclusive assessment by 2050. Uh, I'm going to throw over now to Dr. Jessamy Gleason. Sorry, <laughs> what a depressing reference. Um, hello, everyone. So um, I'm Jess. As Joe hinted to, I work at Nikiri, which at Deakin is our National Institute on Indigenous Knowledges. It's a very long acronym, but essentially what it means is that um, I'm an Indigenous woman who teaches to both internally our CBD students, our curriculum-based delivery students, and I teach externally into our Indigenous Studies minor, so outwards to the broader university, which means I sit at very much a cultural interface. Um, and to just acknowledge as well as everyone else has done, I am on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Nikiri itself sits down on the um, beautiful country of the Wadarung people. And I'd like to pay my respects to all traditional custodians, elders, past, present, emerging, and any other First Nations people in the room as well. Um, what I, and as I'll sort of talk for the next few minutes, I'll explain that unfortunately I haven't had as much time to attend a lot of the symposium stuff as I'd like. And as I sort of talk through what I've been um, doing, even in this last week, hopefully you'll get a, a bit of a hint as to why, because for us, it's very much peak curriculum redevelopment season. And that means a lot of, a lot of forms, a lot of talking on our end, and then a lot of forms for everyone. But um. The first note that I wanted to start off with is a bit of a quote, which is that it's not possible to bring Indigenous knowledges and plonk it into the curriculum and say, hey, you know, we're done. There it is. You've got yourself in week eight. We've given you five slides and off you go. That that never works well for us. But that's how we set things up for students a lot of the time is that we tend to silo it off or that I've seen a lot of siloing off of these knowledges. So when, when we get these students, when they come in to us to do an Indigenous Studies minor, we kind of burst their brains wide open by saying, well, why do you, why do you think you know that? What do you know and why do you think you're knowing that in a certain way? And um, we try not to set themselves up with, or set them up with just a here is what you're going to learn and you're actually done. It's much more of a um, how can you know? Why won't you be learning this? We're not going to teach you that. And it's really important that you know that you won't be learning that. Oh, well, why do you think that just because your university will give you all of the information here, there are some things that you're never going to learn here or that you we can't tell you because they're secret business, sacred business, or that just you're not entitled to know and then there's the bigger questions about what can't you know because you're not in the right physical location for it and um 
that's again something that we as um lecturers and as teachers learn over time there are lots of things that I've wanted to teach students about song lines or stories that would involve them physically going out on country to learn that because it's not possible to communicate those things virtually and we can't round up all our students that are learning digitally on the cloud across Australia and put them out on country and say here's what you need to learn so then it's a challenge of what is the digital version of that and where is it perhaps weaker or stronger or just different accordingly? Um, how, we, how we get students and their responses to, well, you can't learn that is really interesting <laughs> because sometimes they're like, oh, well, that's fine. And other times they're like, we feel much more entitled to all of this knowledge because we're um, pay, paying for it potentially, which is again, that understanding of consumerism. But that that idea of how universities are set up for us to learn in a certain way is something that I come up against a lot. If we're asking students to um, reproduce things that have a written emphasis, what happens when our students don't learn this way? So externally, if I'm teaching the I and D minor to um, students in main, mainstream, Deakin, written emphasis tends to be fine. They're used to that. But if instead I go for something that's um, for our grad dip, which is our Indigenous students, if I wanted to do the majority of, you know, assessments as oral storytelling tasks or as yarning circles or as visual mapping, how does the university respond to that? If I rock up and say to the curriculum committee or somewhere else, well, it's going to be 100% this and that's inclusive for us, the, the other systems and structures that are there may not support me in doing that or may have quite a few questions to ask. And then finally, we get to how we teach students in a way that's our way and that is inclusive for us, but may not be again for the um, Western mainstream students. So students can be very much used to certain and particular structures. And if we don't give them that, if we teach them in a way that is a lot more non-linear and a lot more um, yarning and a lot more sit down, talk it through, you'll learn not through all the slides I'm about to show you, but through the communication that we're about to have, it's going to be much more um, unidirectional well it's going to be much more talking they tend to really freak out and get a little bit destabilized initially because the structure they feel the structure isn't there so we have to manage both their expectation and teach them that the structure is different and then show them that um the the hierarchies that they're used to may not make sense so we show them, for example, that, you know, in teaching, you've got your tutor, then you've got your lecturer, and then you've got your unit chair. But if they come into our um, classroom, that won't work. It's going to be different levels of me as a younger woman with one very basic level of knowledge in some respects, and then a senior woman who's actually only, only teaching as the tutor, they would view as going around her to me as the traditional hierarchy. But in reality, it's actually the reverse and she holds much more of the power in those settings. And then it's finally how we manage the practicality of inclusivities, which are just the questions that I've been dealing with across today. So if we have all of our Indigenous staff marking hundreds of assignments on the impacts of colonisation, that's we need to allow extra hours for staff because that's so many impacts. How do we then indigenize Western content back into our institute and for our own CBD students? And finally, because I know I've got a few colleagues in here and they may not have realized I've been doing that, but how do we work alongside our, you know, broader staff members and our colleagues and get them speaking and thinking our way? So we can produce assessment tasks that are inclusive for us and that they know why we're doing it. We don't have to explain ourselves every step of the way. So how do we not just indigenize by stealth, but how do we sneak up on some of their misunderstandings? And when do we take the time to intervene with their knowledges or challenge things? And when do we, for example, with a lot of the people I work with and design units with that don't sit in Nikiri, give them pre-readings. I give my colleagues some pre-readings to say, here is what we're doing on Indigenous knowledges. Here is where we want to be inclusive. Can you please read this thing? Because you'll know a little bit more about why we're doing it beforehand. So how do we work within and around all of that to get inclusive assessment for all of our students. I think I've just thrown a lot of different questions at everyone, hopefully for some descriptions, but I think, Joe, we're um, 
ready for more questions, more Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Good rounding up and uh, a bit of a uh, different slant on, well, we've had four, well, some of the things definitely coincide and other things are great ideas coming from different perspectives. Um, so, so far we have two questions in the Q&A and for everyone uh, in the audience, uh, just a reminder that if you would like to pop your question in, it's in the little bar, hopefully at the bottom of your screen, next to the chat icon, there's Q&A, pop your question in there. And if you like other people's questions, you can also thumbs up them to make them go to the top of the uh, list. So I'll go with the top one by Tom, Worthing oh, Tom Worthington. What is the problem we are trying to solve with assess very deep question. Um, not sure who would like to respond to that. Thanks, Joe. Um, look, I guess there's two ways to take this. There's a, a broader non-inclusion related one, like well, why the hell do we assess? What What is the problem for which assessment is the solution? And then there's another take on it, which is what are the inclusion problems with assessment? I think I might address the first one of those, the broader thing of why we assess, because I'd love to come to the defence of assessment. I feel like it uh, is sometimes in need of a, a defence. So I'm, I'm going to do that and then I might throw over for a, a broader conversation about the inclusion problems with it. I mean, to, we, to me, we need to assess in the assessment of learning sort of sense just to know if people have met the outcomes that we want them to meet, to know if they need further help to be able to meet those outcomes, to know if we need to change what we're doing, and ultimately to know if they can go out into the world as safe and competent practitioners of the thing. Nowhere in there did I mention exams or tests or anything like that. We just need some ways to know that people can do the things that we say they can do, and if they can't, that we know about it and we can get in there and intervene and help. So that's my defensive assessment. I think we need assessment as part of education. I'd be really uncomfortable if we got rid of assessment entirely. Who does the assessment? Could be anybody. Traditionally, it's been us, but you so Nibbenen talked a fair bit at the symposium about self-assessment in the discipline of mathematics and his PhD work. That's legitimate assessment. We just need acts of assessment in there somewhere to know if education has worked, to know if people are capable of the things they're striving to do. There's the defensive assessment. I'll throw over to someone else to critique assessment in terms of uh, inclusion. I'm not sure if it's necessarily a, a defensive assessment or what, but to, to to outline how we, you know, how we pass on knowledge and understand knowledge, which for us is the essence of not just university, but uh, understanding and, you know, working through information you don't you will given get given the same information or the same story and you pull things out from it in different ways and you don't necessarily get all the layers in that story all those different levels of meaning and information you certainly don't ascend to the next layer in that spiral until you've demonstrated you understand the previous one and it's interesting to me whenever I do this reading which is um uh, th there's a particular reading on the different layers of meaning um in Indigenous stories but how similar that looks to assessment tasks and hurdles and that kind of stuff it, it, it's actually a really beautiful mirror of saying you you need to demonstrate a competence and assessment or whatever it would be before you can then go on to that next level and if not then you just stay there you exist at whatever level you're on previously. So for me, assessment exists as a way to gain further information again. So that would be my contribution. Jess and Phil, um, I, I think for me, if I look at assessment in terms of equity, um, it, it does boil down to, you know, if you, you know, when you think of in terms of educational equity, um, and I've, I've sort of studied that area in some depth from a student perspective. So you have a student populations who do not feel that they belong at university. And, and so we, we really do need to work very hard to deconstruct um, our university structures to unpack why 
they have such a strong sense of limited belonging. And assessment, I think, is a really good example of one of those sort of taken for granted structures. I'm sure there's great people out there who do fantastic things in assessment. But, you know, the, 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 the mass, if you like, of assessment is really about defining what knowledge is and how you demonstrate competency in that knowledge. And that is very exclusionary. You know, it's a certain definition of knowledge. It's a certain way of knowing, um, you know, and I think Jess, I think, highlighted that really well in her um, her overview. You know, we, we, we need to really uh, consider what, wh whose voice is being privileged here, whose knowledge is being privileged, and what does that, what message does that send to our students? So that's why um, I think we, it's a problem and we need to um, think carefully about this. Thanks, Sarah. And I just uh, think I'd make a quick point to um, add to the end of this. Um, you know, assessment uh, has for such a long time been a mechanism by which we sort people. And um, to throw it away is not necessarily the answer, yeah? Um, to, to make things, um, uh, and well, we could talk about disability quite uh, clearly, that assessment of a disability sorts the, the people who are assessed as having one into a different category. But like all of these things, it doesn't need to be taken at wholesale and it just becomes a question of how do we, how do, we do it differently? Um, so it's not to throw it away. Uh, next question is from Margaret Beeman. If you had to nominate a focus for change with regards to assessment from your own perspective, what would it be? Sarah, would you like to go first? <laughs> oh, no, I feel like I'm being assessed. Um, there was quite a few things that popped into my head. I mean, as a as someone who is a teaching academic for research academic for many, many years, I mean, on a really fundamental level, I, I I, I hated all the oh, the rationalization around assessment. Um, you know, the having the, the 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 levels I had to go through to get anything. Uh, I shouldn't really, I don't want to refer to a particular institution, but I think it's quite common across institutions. So it was this idea that in order to get an assessment item over the line, which had to be approved, was I it, it had to fit a certain criteria. And I'd love to see that criteria opened up and um, to be, you know, to actually be challenged. That, I think that's what I'd, I'd want to do, to give people, um, teachers, educators, facilitators, uh, greater latitude in terms of what assessment might look like. Uh, and I, I, I agree with Ben, I don't think we're throwing assessment out. It's just, can we rethink it? Uh, a little. Mm. Anyone else got another idea about what to change in assessment? Hey, um, thanks, Joe. I think um, one of the things that popped into my head when I heard that question was to think about um, uh, the PhD. You know, that is uh, a piece of assessment that is quite enormous, um, a thesis, uh, roughly 100,000 words, and who's going to read it? Uh, well, hopefully the supervisors. Uh, the examiners, and then maybe it's deemed worthy to go off and get published. It's such a, a horribly constraining piece, um, and 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 it's a really big one, and it's an important one. But if we were to broaden things out, um, and, and I'm thinking here of students who struggle to write or to express themselves in a particular way or a particular language, uh, maybe there's other ways they could express their learning to a doctoral level. Um, or a master or a postgrad level um, that that doesn't necessarily need to be this series of hoops that need to be jumped through. I, I can I jump in? Sorry, I'm being. No, I just I think Ben, you raise a really important point because to me the PhD is not about the thesis. You know, it's about the journey. And so when I look back on my own PhD, um, my my learning did not occur around putting together a body of work in a thesis. My learning actually occurred in that period of time. I learned a lot about myself and, um, you know, and it actually prepared me for academic life, which is sort of in a way, but but yet none of that is assessed. So um, that, that I think that's a really important point. And I, 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 I like the, 
the journey metaphor with assessment, you know, taking it is the journey rather than the destination. Yeah, I've um, I've spent a lot of today um, in two really odd places that coincide with this conversation. So this morning I had a meeting with um, our marketing staff here to explain to them how the graduate diploma copy on our website needed to be rewritten to de-emphasize the written component of the thesis, which ironically going through Indigenous knowledge is they still produce a 12,000 word written thesis, which is um, ironic to me, and we, how we need to further emphasize the culturally safe and um, learning within a community aspects of our course, um, which again, I don't think a lot of um, degrees do, and particularly when we're learning online. A lot of students feel quite isolated, but for our students, we really try and bring them into Nikiri and fly them down and do a lot of um, do a lot of that to help them learn and um, again the how we even talk about the gaining of knowledge it's for what are your graduate outcomes where are your students going where are they employed and so when I got this template of what are your students doing I'm like well it's it's indigenous knowledge is an indigenous research it's it's you know they might be going on to further research they might be taking it all back to community it's there are a lot of different things there and then I spent this afternoon reworking all of the 12,000 word thesis stuff and the entire degree so we had less written component more oral presentations more um mapping of indigenous knowledge systems both locally and internationally and generally just like clawing through the entire um all the rubrics all the assessment tasks weighing them all up so it's it's interesting this this question of what would you do because i feel really um a lot of our work is constrained through rubrics a lot of our um how we want to talk about knowledge is is constrained through um really well intentioned and i don't i love a good rubric but even the structure of it and um how we pick the right words so not using philosophy using something else that works for us and tells our students that they already know inherently or a lot of the time they know what we want them to do we just need to get the right words for it rather than philosophy so I don't have a good answer for you Margaret but I do know that um I would de-emphasize some of the written work in favor of other areas or other things that suit more for us in the area I work in. I'll, I'll jump in with my my answer to Margaret's thing and it would just be when we do things that we know exclude, to really, really question why we're doing it and demand evidence for why it's okay to do this exclusionary thing. Uh, one example that I'll give is over the pandemic, a lot of exams at some institutions turned into timed take-home tasks where the students given you know, 24 hours to do some thing in lieu of doing an exam. And when asked why we're giving them the 24 hours and not just making it an assignment, the response is, oh, to stop them from cheating. Well, I, I'm, I'm here to say it's not going to have any impact on cheating, setting it as a 24-hour task versus a give them, you know, weeks like it's a standard assignment. It is going to have an impact on people who don't have their life perfectly laid out for that 24-hour period. But there were a few things like that that we recently saw just kind of accepted. Some other changes saw more critiques. So things like remote proctored exams, for instance, did see quite a lot of debate around them. But yeah, question why and, and really push back at some of these changes and even maybe push back at some of the things that we've taken for granted as good effective practice. Yeah, my thing's cheating, things like face-to-face -face exams, we do those to stop students from cheating. And we do them to uh, kind of deal with academic workloads because we don't have to provide written feedback to students on them. Now, I can buy that response, although it comes with its own you know, challenges. But the thing about dealing with cheating by having exams, look into the body of work about exam cheating. Cheating does happen a fair bit in exams. And there's research to suggest that things like contract cheating are more prevalent in exams than in take-home assignments. So question why? Why do we do these exclusionary practices? Wonderful. Lots of good ideas. Um, I, I note the top question now is, uh, well, it's got five upvotes. So some from an anonymous attendee. So some disciplines require particular types of assessments that are not inclusive 
for example, exams, due to regulatory body requirements. For example, nursing in New Zealand still require exams. How do we work around this? And what's your thinking in disrupting this? And perhaps if I can add my own onto that, how do we involve industry bodies and regulatory bodies in these conversations? I'll jump in then. Um, I think that that's a really interesting point and um, it might seem on the surface that this is um, inescapable, but um, that takes me to thinking about kind of the first principles of the design of the course and um, uh, the inherent requirements of that course uh, right there may be exclusionary. And that's a problem because it, it does mean that there'll be people who are not able to uh, into the profession who, who, who would otherwise make great nurses. Uh, so I think it's, it's, um, it's about bringing uh, a lot of uh, stakeholders around the table to, to really question the inherency of, of those sorts of things. I think a pretty perfect answer. <laughs> the rest of the panel is nodding. I, I, I might just add that some professional bodies are more keen to get engaged in this conversation than others. And we do need to go to them. I think if we go to them collectively as a big block, we can achieve great things. And I was in a presentation recently where Sue Bennett talked about doing this with the New South Wales uh, teaching accreditation body up there. And that there was just strength in going as a group and it, it worked. And I know that Juan has commented that Michael Sang, he commented in a different seminar that professional bodies were actually pretty open to changing exams at the beginning of the pandemic. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, now to a bit more of a practical question. Can you give me, by, sorry, by Dr. Vicky Huang, can you give me some things I can do at the coalface of teaching? What should I do to improve my teaching and learning materials? And can you provide discrete, doable examples? Jess, I'm going to yeah, call on you. Yeah, that's totally fine. That's <laughs> totally fine. I was thinking through this one. So how I, gosh, how I make things, include, it's really tricky because I teach in Indigenous Studies if I was teaching. So it's different when students enter my classroom because they're there expecting to, to an extent, learn things and be challenged. But I would say that it's, um, the things I do is not, not ever assume anyone is or does belong to a particular um, minority. I find a lot of the time, both when I was a student and now as a teacher, that students will um, expect other students to be agents of change. And that's that puts a lot of pressure on students. So if I'm in a classroom teaching and um, I have maybe one Indigenous student and then a lot of other students, students will turn and ask that Indigenous students questions um, and expect them to maybe be or have them be the agents of change. So I try and take it my role seriously as a teacher to not do that. In saying that, I know that a lot of my um, colleagues who aren't Indigenous and teach in this space have a lot of pressure to get it get it right when they are teaching these areas and um, I've received a lot of sort of um, nervous and excited and apprehensive emails from colleagues going we really want to do this but we don't know how to blah can you help us and look that's that would be another whole job in and of itself for me so there's there's this um, getting it right when you if you do want to include Indigenous knowledges or if you do want to um, try and interweave things in a way that isn't that example I gave of siloing have um, realistic expectations about about who can help you because we don't always have the time to help curate your entire course. See what, um, so at Deakin, we have a really fantastic TALIS list that's been set up. So a reading list of resources that um, people can use to draw some different knowledges into their classroom and um, help set up discussions in a way that's useful, but also doesn't put, you know, heaps of pressure on um, us as the Indigenous, Indigenous Knowledges Institute. Um, but just uh, start fostering those relationships as well because I can't help someone who's just emailed me I can't read every single master's thesis or whatever else 
but I can foster relationships and that's how we work a lot of the time I can build those relationships and it needs to be reciprocal I can't just come in and design a unit or help you with yours if you're not going to invest some time back into us and our foundational units of study and help grow and be invested in the institute itself so that that's a lot and sorry it's a really big response um, but I hope that helps indicate where we come from I might jump in as well because um I think following on from what Jess was saying, um, I think it's a really good question um, from Vicky, I think it was, and I, I would put it back to Vicky because I, I think um, I think by the start of disrupting assessment is actually being open to change, which she clearly is because she's asked the question. But then actually the responsibility lies with you in, in the sense that you probably will need to go out and talk to other people and talk to people like Jess or in your uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander unit or talk to other people, academics, to find out what they're doing with assessment. Uh, be open. I, I'd also say that you, you probably need to be prepared for um, a level of discomfort from students if you're being really... Uh, if you're trialing different assessments, I think you also need to work with students and, um, you know, I bring in students as partners. So talk to students about assessment. You know, they're the key. They're, they're the most important people. And yet that we impose this assessment on students. Well, why aren't we engaging in conversations with students to find out what what would work for them? What way do they want to be assessed in their learning? Um, how how what would benefit them the most then when you trial things be prepared for feedback from students so when you do an assessment ask them how, how did you find that you know how could i improve on that so actually i think it's about being really open and looking at assessment not as okay you've got 20 minutes to do an online quiz but actually trialing different approaches and, and putting yourself out there as a vulnerable academic you know and saying i i'd like to really move assessment on i want i want to look at ways that is really going to complement your learning in this subject these are some of my ideas let's give it a go but i i'd like to hear back from you and then also working with other partners around the the university so another big big answer but i don't think there's a quick uh, solution there's no uh, we can't point you to a website on this one it's it, it it's actually developing bespoke and contextualized assessments to your particular field and to your particular institution. Yeah, and I think if I can take chair prerogative um, in a project that I have been working on with Jess, um, it is about knowing your students and understanding within your own cohort, within the students you've you've got in your subject and there are sort of different equity groups that might crop up in some places more than others. It's knowing who those students are and then working out what what works for them with them um, so yeah it's it's not an easy easy start but um, it's very worthwhile I, I have something that I think I, I don't want to sell an easy quick fix because it's not and there aren't any here but something that uh, Trina Jordan St. Jaw said in a small group that I was in was around um, at the moment our current practice of really requiring students to disclose everything to us in order to get anything from us, uh, having to tell us things they might not actually want to tell us, uh, it, it's really not working. Um, and we talked about in our small group ways where we might be able to take as a, as a small, quick, easy win, the accommodations that we routinely have to provide to students who ask for it, and they have to ask for it and give all this evidence and whatever, seeing which of those accommodations we can just provide to everybody or everybody who asks for it, but without requiring people to jump through all these hoops and other arduous things. It's, it's not gonna solve the big problems, but it's a, a small little step towards it. Yeah, and can I just add as well, I think um, uh, I, I take uh, formative assessment a very serious matter in teaching. And that is to say, um, you know, lay out uh, material for students and engage with them in their making sense of it. Um, the other thing, I mean, um, uh, I guess similar to what Jess said, I mean, I'm teaching about inclusive ed. Um, 
So it's a it's a very specific area. But one thing I find um, that takes a bit of um, cajoling perhaps is that um, we're really asking students to put themselves on the page and to engage in how they interpret the knowledge and how they would then go and apply it. And so that's why I think formative assessment is a really important thing because by that way, engaging with the teacher, uh, we can all sort of talk about it together before they then go off and, and do the, the, the summative assessment uh, for which marks would be um, awarded, if you like. So uh, that's one thing I would say. Thanks, Ben. And you've actually answered another question, which was about, you know, what's the, um, could formative assessment help with all of this? So you have said yes. <laughs> Um, to keep on with the upvoted questions, you so, um, Nimanen, would like to bring up the notion of individualisation related to assessment and grading. Inclusive assessment is an inherently communal project, I think, or he thinks. How could we promote interdependence through inclusive assessment within systems that so strongly rely on individual performance and certification? The individualised idea of the student also connects with this medical accommodation disability model. So what? how, how do we do this in a more communal way? And, and Can I jump in on that one first? Yeah. Thank you, Juza. That's a great question. I think there's an absurdity of thinking of inclusive education in terms of individualisation, just from off the bat. Uh, and I think uh, in, to that end, it's important to think about how we could do tasks that people do together and in doing those tasks together to think about some of the challenges and, and advantages, disadvantages, things that were gained, things that were lost, um, things that they might have had to let go to, things they learned about themselves in doing collaboration. Uh, and that's, that's the sort of thing that um, I try to incorporate in some assessment tasks. Um, just so they can have a taste of that. And a lot of students often uh, tell me that they were quite daunted by having to work with someone, and that's very common. Um, but in the end, they, they, when they're asked to focus on the effect of that, um, it comes out as something that they really uh, cherish and, and something that they learn from um, significantly about, you know, what, what does that might, how does that then translate into the classroom? Um, so there you go. Thanks, Ben. Anyone? Yep, Phil, go ahead. I, I, I'm going to you know, echo again that I'm not very radical. Um, as a child of the 80s, I'd be very disappointed to hear that. But um, I think there is a point in time that we need to know what students are capable of independently. Um, and that point in time is at graduation. So we do need individual assessment of people. Up until that point, though, I'm really flexible with how we do assessment and the different types of collaboration and supports and joyous synergy with other people our students have. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to stand my ground a little bit on the need for individual assessment of people because it's, it's kind of what we have to do within the current framework that we have. We'd have to change things up a lot to get away from it. But it only needs to happen at that degree level right at the end. Everything up to that point, we could go all collective and and wonderful um sort of to add to this and then swing wildly around and take it a little off track but i'll i'll go to adding to this first we try and um of course get our students together the intensives are a real luxury for us in fostering that community where students still do they do group work they also do a lot of different individual assessment tasks but drawing them together and learning in that real space and having that opportunity to yarn which is different to um and i should add different to just a general discussion it is a real really specific and unique space to um learn and exchange um ideas so that there is that collectivity at different points in time the part where i want to take it wildly off track as well is um in relation to a specific set of publications in which we talk about indigenous knowledges and the the country of the women that where they come from is credited as first author and so in this sense it is a group project between a group of women and the country that they come from and it is um Bawaka country that is credited as the first author of a paper and it's credited as the real knowledge holder in this sense and the um 
the leader, the leader of that group work that has been these series of publications. And it's just fascinating to me that how knowledge, our knowledge is learned and transformed and published means that even though this group has done it collectively, there's an underlying layer of country there that needs to be foregrounded as the first author in this really Western sense. So that's my radical departure from the question. But again, that idea of what do we even understand as group work too. So uh, another practical question here from Dallas Wingrove. How do we foster how do we foster inclusivity when teaching a diverse cohort in the large class context, taught across multiple campuses, whilst recognizing academic workload and the pressures on the amount of time allocated to marking and so on? I mean, in one of the sessions earlier, I suggested we should the, one of the priorities for inclusive assessment is a time machine um, to create a little bit more time for everyone. But you know, perhaps um, the panel have a few more practical ideas that don't extend to science fiction yeah all right look i think what roller just chucked in the chat doing less with less i mean really it's that's kind of what what we got to do um i i'd love to have some sort of great efficiency thing and it kind of makes me feel like a bit of a snake oil salesperson um it is doing less with less you know, I've, I've done a couple of projects on academics assessment and feedback design practices and the people who did amazing things didn't do some other things. Uh, so, you know, I'm thinking in the work I've done on feedback, some academics took a couple of weeks of tutes and turned them into feedback sessions and just said, we've had to jettison two weeks of the content to be able to do this and we're okay about that. I don't think there's any easy... Um, easy answers here. It's it's doing less with less and being okay about it because we're doing more of the important things. It's um it's interesting to me because we're and Joe, you will have heard me talking about this many a time. So I apologize. But we're um rolling out this unit that's um an indigenous education unit that's um starting it started this year with 200 odd students which is probably a hundred more than what we're used to at Nikiri and next year it's becoming or it is already a core unit so that means we will have um eight nine hundred students which to us is a tidal wave of students coming in and learning about Indigenous education and so we really have had to try and adapt how we um, how we do things and assess students at the level that we want to, whilst also recognising that we need to locate, um, first of all, we need to locate um, nine Indigenous peoples or, you know, fellow people that can help us teach this, which is huge for us, but then also give the students the feedback that they need when launching into this new area and uh, becoming teachers. So it's, it's a really fascinating question for me because it will be different to what we how we typically do things at Nikiri and I guess we're fortunate in that education space because we're looking at things like lesson plans and trying to get students to break down that siloing of knowledge in primary and early years to help them then um bring Indigenous knowledges back into it. So they're working off this, this template, which makes it a bit easier for us to mark 900 of the, the things, but then again, displaying their own knowledge and how they develop things like lesson plans. It's a really, um, sorry, quite contextual response to this question, but it's really, it's been helpful for us because they, they work off a template essentially, which we're lucky in. So we can keep them in line and in a certain way that we can still mark and feedback relatively efficiently, but the students still get a chance to show off their knowledges too. So we've been fortunate in that respect. I don't know, come back to me in a year and I'll answer that one. <laughs> yeah, look, I would just add to um, uh, or, or, or go from, from that point, it's, you, you can't, um, just have an influx of enrolments and expect to be doing everything the same way. Um, impossible. And I think at the same token, you can't expect a diverse um, uh, student group to come in and, and expect to have to do it the same way. Everything has to be contextually specific. Yeah. So on the subject of diversity of students, we do have a few questions that I think are around um, the, the gatekeeping that happens at all stages um, throughout higher education. So um, 
an anonymous attendee asks, how do we address the inherent exclusivity and inaccessibility of higher ed in the first place? Um, and if we welcome more people who have been typically excluded or marginalised as part of this community and um, have them as stakeholders in the conversation, could this help with inclusive assessment? Um, but then um, Maria Kutaya also um, comments, you know, is there a need for formal assessment of learning? And how does this, what extent does this um, have that gatekeeping function? So I think that there's something around gatekeeping at different points. Um, and I wondered if Sarah had any comments about the, that bigger picture of, you know, how assessment fits in with everything else. Yeah, look, I think it's, it's sort of the contradictions of higher ed so it's it is a big it's a it's a big issue so i actually think within australia we've done a pretty good job of getting students from very diverse backgrounds through the door into university um but now it's about actually keeping them and that's why assessment is so important because so often it's assessment that makes or break students so I can't, I don't, I, I'm going to be honest, I don't have an answer to this question, but what I can tell you is that students that I've interviewed as part of my own research, and that I estimate that that would be at well over a thousand to 1200 students that I have conducted interviews and surveys with. So for students, it's from equity backgrounds, it's often the assessment that is the signifier of whether they belong in the institution or not. So these students might be very high achieving, or they might just have come in like um, with, with no ATARs or whatever. Uh, it doesn't really matter. And uh, what matters is that they often think that they shouldn't be at university. And that comes across in the way that they speak about university, the, the way that they describe their uh, attendance at university, their family biography, uh, so they may well would be the first in their family to come to university. So that sense of not belonging at university is very, very entrenched. So what? how do they measure their belonging? They measure their belonging through assessments. So the first assessment that they have, um, they don't, they, they, it, it, it's how they do on that assessment that really, really matters to them. And it's often at that point, if it's a poor mark, if it's a if they fail, then that's the signal. You don't belong. You know, time to go. Um, so, you know, I I can't in a way when you, again and again in interviews talking about assessment and 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 talking about failure. And Rola and I have talked about this. That as well, the failure is when they describe or define failure. Uh, students talk about the problem lying with them and never with the institution. So I failed because, you know, or I, I didn't know how to, it's all this personalized statements. So um, what works for students um, that, that in my experience is that certainly in those initial stages of university, they don't need to fail, they need encouragement, and and that might that doesn't that's not about giving everyone a, a ribbon and telling them they're wonderful. It's actually about um, not making it about failing or passing. It's about constructing ways of measuring, um, you know, what what they've done and giving them critical feedback and building and frame scaffolding them to the next level of learning. So um, I suppose it, it's a very long winded way uh, uh, of saying that in term, particularly in terms of equity students, it, it, it's really about how do we reframe um, assessments or whatever, however we want to call them so that they support them um, to grow and develop because, you know, it, 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 they're coming with knowledge gaps that need to be uh, so, you know, need to be filled. That's that. That's no question. But often, once they're over those initial hurdles, they'll go on and do as well as any other student, um, as we know the research has indicated. So, a very big answer to to that very big question. <laughs> could, could I just suggest, like, we get rid of grades in first year? 
I, I don't I don't know why we have grades in first year. Uh, so much heartache and because uh, there's harms to students. But if I go back to the sort of you know technical assessment stuff, what do grades in first year even tell us of in terms of what someone's capable of when they graduate? I'd argue nothing. Um, so let, let's just ditch them. And I, I think gatekeeping has such negative connotations. And I hate to be the person here arguing for gatekeeping, but we do need mechanisms to decide how we're going to let people into the institution. I'm not saying the ones we've got now are good, but we do need to have ways to choose who we let in because it's unethical to accept people that we are not going to support to succeed. It's totally not okay. So we need some sort of gate there. We need some sort of gate at the other end to say, we accredit you can do the things we say you can do. But in all the intervening steps, we need support, not sort of score bad in your first quiz and it's going to be on your permanent record. That's stupid. I think you found your radical streak, Phil. <laughs> oh, thanks, Rolla. I was going to um, say to that as well with that with that idea of gatekeeping, I guess, the, the, the gate and how wide it is, so to speak, has to sit alongside the supports that we're offering to students. So if those supports, which I don't know if we're talking about enough here, but really, I mean, for, maybe we are and I, um, I missed it, but for us at Nikiri, we have alternate entry paths so students can enter into a graduate diploma having not finished high school as long as they are interviewed and can do an assessment task that um, demonstrates their <laughs> ability to write coming back to that old chestnut again right which um, is even for us that's why the interview component is there so alongside um, that that's because the supports that we have are I would say a lot stronger than what maybe other other students in the mainstream university would receive so our, our gate, so to speak, is um, wider or differently structured to those at the, the university too. Um, but yes, in terms of um, first year assessment and first year grades, quite happy to chuck them. We, we set ours up quite differently. We, we have a foundational unit that we want students to do. So we don't have to consistently re-explain the impacts of colonisation. <laughs> So it is purely there as a hurdle. So we don't catch ourselves getting third year students having to say, we're not going to debate you on what colonisation and its impacts is. Yeah, I would just add, you know, the gatekeeping, we've, we've used that term and that and practices around that for so long to keep people out. And now I feel like we're wondering if we can use the gate to keep people in. Uh, let's just keep it open. Nice metaphor. So the next question at the top of the list is from Matt Brett. Um, and he asks, or he says, I really like Philip's notion of cheating and inclusion entwined by issues of ethics and validity. Does the panel have a view as to how institutions and the broader system can bolster and strengthen a focus on ethics and validity in assessment? I might, I might jump onto this one just because he, he mentions me. Um, I just want to say one thing that I heard recently at an academic integrity event, which was that academic integrity or our ways of sort of helping students to act ethically or whatever in themselves need to be ethical. And I think that's a, that's a nice thing to take forward into all of these, these conversations. Whatever we do in assessment, whatever we do in the name of stopping cheating, it, it needs in and of itself to be ethical. We can't cut corners there. Um, I guess on that note, but something we don't, I mean, I don't see offered or debated or discussed in other areas is how we, not even how we necessarily um, assess um, knowledge or cheating or that kind of stuff, but ethically speaking, how and where do we um, engage with students in a way that's appropriate? So, and it actually goes back to that conversation or that what I mentioned before about <laughs> how and where we're willing to debate students on fundamental things like the existence and impacts of colonisation. I at the moment can't um, and I don't really assess students on that, but I do spend a lot of my time hammering them on not capitalising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples or Indigenous, which is a very small example, but it leads to this wider points of ethical engagement and 
and how and where we can fairly um, engage or assess or discuss with students these these kinds of things and how um, the the lack of value that that's placed on in other areas and then when students come into this and then realize that they're expected to do a heck of a lot more work and pay a heck of a lot more attention to things like terminology and appropriateness and cultural values in this unit than what they've been encountering elsewhere and that that really steps up for them and in some ways I can tell by the assess end of assessment too if they've been doing it because if they haven't paid attention then they're not capitalizing those words and I can go well you clearly haven't been to any assessment to uh, any you know shoots in the last hour many weeks so it's it's interesting that's it's not just cheating for me but it's that ethical engagement too and the restrictions or allowances that we have around that okay i i was leaving this question for um a, a little bit later because i think it's actually really tricky um another anonymous attendee was has asked how would you define or describe inclusive assessment to someone who is new to teaching but a subject matter expert i'm after a definitional description that will create desire for people to take action so how can we describe inclusive assessment in a way that inspires people to do things differently and i know earlier today we had a discussion of whether inclusion was the right term but ben would you like to yeah i think there's a few ways you could come at this but um uh, let me put this on the table first and suggest that it's um, a way of uh, letting or having um, students and staff engage in knowledge um, in ways that they can demonstrate their understanding. And those ways are partly what make it inclusive in terms of it being different ways. And um, if I... I, I... Just add to Ben, because I think you're that's brilliant, Ben. Um, and also, perhaps you may have said this, but uh, I'm a bit distracted because the chat is going off. I'm looking at chat, I'm looking at QA, but it's also extending what our conception of what knowledge is, what, what, like, how actually unpacking that concept of knowledge and if you want, for want of a better word, competency and. Um, you know, embracing a more pluralistic notion of knowledges and, um, yeah, I think that's fundamental to it as well, not, not just relying on very Western epistemologies. Yeah, and um, with that, so again, that, that definition or understanding of what is knowledge, like I can't, I can't decide what is accessible students will tell me what is accessible or inclusive um, and if they don't like it then I expect them and I rely on them to tell me not just through um, formal student feedback mechanisms as well because they <laughs> don't work in the way I want them to so I rely on many different ways to get that feedback and agree with students about what we'll be assessing what we'll be talking about or learning and then how we do it and find myself you know contorting myself and other assessments around to get what we want students to know um so mutually agreed agreed upon to an extent like because we service our particular communities and they tell us if this isn't fitting what they want it to um so mutually agreed upon understandings of what knowledge is and then how we assess it and it's interesting how things like major course reviews we do them like we do them but we do them very differently because having gone through this process this year it's been a revelation to sit down in those panels and listen to our traditional custodians past students others telling us what needs to be fixed in the course and then all of us at the university level the curriculum people the everyone else just mostly sit back and let the students and traditional custodians in that talk and tell us what they think is inclusive and what needs to change for them so that that's been a real eye-opener for me and relying on our broader community in those respects um, I mean, I, I would just really echo that. If you want to know what inclusive assessment is, ask your, your stakeholders that are, that are involved. Um, and if I'm trying to sell inclusive assessment to the, the academic, um, I guess I'd just say your assessment only really assesses if it's inclusive. Otherwise, it's just got all these other little 
hidden biases and things in it that you don't quite know are there, that you don't quite know how they work, that are really muddying any understanding anybody's getting about what the students are capable of. So for it to be decent assessment, it has to be inclusive assessment. Great message from all of you, I think. Um, now, there was only one question left and then another one cropped up. <laughs> and the, the second question from Suri Naidu is, how are institutions dealing with contracted submissions that are gaining momentum across the board? And Phil, I might get you to respond to that one in text because um, we've only got five minutes left. And I, I think this last question from Sunal Singh, we see these conversations progressing rapidly in relation to high stakes assessments in high school. How might we articulate design assess and accredit learning in a way which better reflects the diverse knowledge sets, skills and dispositions of students by creating broader and deeper ways to recognise learning. What can we do to progress this work in universities? And I'd like to turn this question into a what's a one sentence thing that you could recommend that people go out and do next to progress the work? What would you recommend that people do? In their own tasks. I make, I'm, well, I give my students, uh, sorry, this is going to be two sentences at least. I give my students reflective tasks and I ask them to tell me not just what they've learned, but what their locatedness is in the learning, not just what has changed for them across this unit, but what has changed for them across all units and where and how what they've learned has impacted them. And that gives me a much better way to assess their learning than any of these major high stakes assignments. Um, I'll go next. Um, I think it's uh, be prepared to fail. So if you're asking students that they may fail at something, then I think it's taking chances. So be experimental if you can. If you've got that space in, in, your, in your teaching um, as a teacher, if you've got the space to be creative and to try new things, do it and you, you may fail. And, they, and you may get a lot of pushback from students as well who might be discomforted by that process. But just, just be prepared to fail and learn from your failure and, and keep going. That would be my take home. Yeah, I'll jump in. I think um, high stakes, it's really, it's really tough. But um, ultimately, I think it takes a redesign and that has to be negotiation in collaboration. Bill? Um, sorry, I've, I've been focused on the, the chat and typing away my thing. Yeah, um, yeah look, I, I guess I'd echo what my colleagues have said and recognise that it's really hard and we're all in it together and we're not going to solve it at any of this immediately. This will take time. Wonderful. I think we're all in it together is a lovely way to wind things up. Um, you know, the audience, thank you for being so um, chatty and asking questions today. You, you have been part of this too. Um, in closing this panel, I think, um, I hope that this is not the last that we'll be speaking about this. And I hope that there'll be many more conversations and not just conversations, but action as well, ideas, things, lots of um, fun things to do together. Um, so thank you all for coming along, spending this 90 minutes with us. Um, Rola, anything else to say? No, nothing from Rola. Nothing more. Thank you, everyone. It's been um, lots to think about and um, mull over and continue the conversation with. So thank you all and uh, good afternoon, Thanks. good evening, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> thank Thanks, you. Joe. Thanks, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you to our panellists.